You're listening to Masculinity Redefined, an open and honest discussion with a goal to increase awareness and change the narrative of the harmful gender behaviors known as toxic masculinity. Hello, my name is Jason Carubia, and welcome to our live podcast and roundtable discussion. I'll be your moderate, moderator as we examine the social justice issue known as toxic masculinity. Today, I'm joined by a diverse and insightful panel of guests who intend to deepen the understanding and offer opportunities for changing during our uncertain times. First up is Ben Kroll, uh, he, a Southern Connecticut State University senior communication major with an advertising and promotions concentration and a political science minor. Ben is the co-chair of the YDSA, that's the Young Democratic Socialists of America, and captain of the men's rugby team. Next, we have Brady Agovino, a Southern Connecticut State University Honors College senior with a concentration in advertising and promotions. And the podcast welcomes again, Sammy J, a social justice warrior and social media advocate for the LGBTQ community. Finally, we are joined by Dr. Janani Umama Heshwar, an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology here at Southern Connecticut State University. Her published research and teaching methods include criminology, gender, punishment, the life course, and qualitative research methods. Uh, thank you all again for bringing your unique perspectives to our forum. Uh, and I'd like to start today's discussion by acknowledging that we're all in this form of isolation. We're practicing social distancing. And because of the recent COVID-19 worldwide pandemic, this presents us with a unique challenge of getting our message out despite not being able to speak to an in-person audience. And thankfully, because of technologies of social media, podcasting, video conferencing, uh, we're able to reach out to possibly a larger group than we could in an, an lecture hall. And um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's uh, here as well, um, our, our, our fellow classmates, um, anyone on social media, on our Twitter and uh, our Instagram feed. Feel free to submit any questions that you have to us to those feeds, uh, the Twitter feed and the Instagram feed. Um, we are taking those questions and we'll be doing Q&A later on in the live podcast session. Um, however, for many people, communicating is not so simple. So communication climates with toxic behaviors may be unavoidable during social distancing. Our new normal, us being at home, also creates these barriers, uh, removing how traditional communication channels that monitor and protect people from harm, um, give them an area of grave concern, and specifically with domestic violence. Um, in fact, according to John Hopkins University of Medicine, I'm just going to quote their article here because it's perfect, um, outbreaks of domestic violence or addictive behaviors occur in times of distress. Indeed, there are already reports of spikes in child abuse and domestic violence, which means families stuck at home already face immediate physical danger. Abuse and violence also have a long run downstream effects on health, education, and productivity. Moreover, the very institutions designed to protect victims of abuse and violence that are the courts, uh, social service agencies, and law enforcements, uh, they themselves are shutting down or cutting back while they struggle to determine how to implement our new normal social distancing. And if anyone wants any more information on this study, uh, feel free to check out our website. That's www.masculinityredefined.info and our social media stream. We'll be sharing the links to that study. Um, and without further ado, I'd just like to uh, start off with Dr. Umama Heshwar. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and I'd like to begin with your ex expertise. Um, first question, if you could, uh, what increases of abuses and behaviors are we are we seeing? Like what what type of abuses and what are we expecting during these difficult times? Yeah, so I think you mentioned that uh, domestic violence is one that is really escalating. It's causing a lot of alarm for advocates and scholars alike. Uh, the data that I have seen suggests that um, some cities are seeing a spike. Um, overall, crime has dropped across cities because we are in a, in a social quarantine situation where people aren't out. Uh, but even in cities that haven't seen an increase in domestic violence, uh, we have seen a smaller decrease in domestic violence compared to other crimes. And perhaps the most alarming thing is that uh, we have not seen a drop in the most serious uh, forms of domestic violence. So, so the things like murder, things like aggravated assault. We are not seeing the kind of declines in those forms of crimes that we're seeing in, uh, um, in, in other forms. Uh, that's alarming. Uh, we're there, you know, uh, sort of real time information coming out is suggesting that um, 
uh, abusive partners are actually weaponizing coronavirus in their relationships and uh, using that as a way to advance their abuse. Uh, so, for instance, they're saying, um, you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't want you to report it to the police because then I'll have to go to jail and look at what coronavirus is going to look like in jail, kind of making um, survivors of domestic violence feel guilty about involving law enforcement. And then you have that extra layer where even once law enforcement gets involved, there's only so much they can do right now. Uh, because as we're speaking, there's, uh, I think, a reasonable push to decarcerate, to try and get people out of jails and prisons uh, because coronavirus is running rampant over there and it's so dangerous in, in those confined settings. Uh, but unfortunately, this can be exploited, this feature of the situation, it can be exploited by abusive partners um, who are not going to jail and if they are going to jail go, coming in and out before um, survivors have a chance to put in to get it put into place a safety plan uh, so for instance even when law enforcement is getting involved they're going to jail maybe just for a few hours and then coming right back out uh, before partners have had a chance to get out of that situation uh, and furthermore the people who were supporting um, women in particular who are in these domestic violence situations uh, they aren't there they aren't available to them anymore so uh, advocates are really trying to say we should probably try and start looking for alternatives to our conventional social support agencies. Uh, so perhaps like a grocery store or a pharmacy can be turned into a hub where um, people who are experiencing domestic violence can go and connect with other people and uh, some sort of assistance. So we're seeing that element of it. On the other side, we're seeing prisons are becoming a hotbed for coronavirus. There are some prisons where up to 70% of the people who are incarcerated have tested positive. Um, so prison is already a very, very volatile situation. In my own research, when I've talked to these, they say the smallest thing can set them off because it's such a tense, such a confined um, arena. And so right now, what many criminologists and penologists are worried about is what is what is happening behind the walls? What does it look like? Um, you know, when you when you add fear onto an already kind of emotionally tense situation where hyper masculinity and um, aggression is can be performed at the drop of a hat, what does that look like? Uh, so we're worried about upticks in violence in prisons. We're worried about just mortality. We've got so many aging prisoners, men and women especially men, because so many were incarcerated for nonviolent crimes when they were younger. Um, so we're seeing all of that in addition to some of the things that I'm sure my fellow panelists will be talking about, where men are just uh, afraid to talk. Um, they're afraid to deal with their mental health issues. Um, they're taking social distancing less seriously because it's seen as um, sort of weak and, uh, and fear, fearful to, to agree and accept that this is a danger to themselves and their other, uh, and other people around them. So we're expecting an uptick in all sorts of problematic behaviors that are associated with gender. And then our government is responding in a very classically hyper-masculine way. Uh, ours and others, see, talk, you know, waging a war, using terminology like war, uh, prioritizing things like the economy over welfare families. Uh, these are all classic masculine concerns um, and they're not necessarily the ones that we should be thinking about if we're to get ourselves out of the situation as as intact as possible you you use that word a little bit and we've talked about a little bit in our podcast earlier that word hyper masculinity could you give us just an example of what those types of behaviors are just for people who are joining new to the podcast series um, what those types of behaviors that would be looked at and and could be a problem in, in communication of course. So um, hypermasculinity typically is uh, considered this exaggeration of the classic traits that we associate with masculinity. So in a situation where men are put in a, uh, are, are kind of expected to confront the fact that they are not masculine in the conventional sense, so either they have race disadvantage or they have class disadvantage or they're incarcerated. Um, you know, anything that kind of uh, deviates from that traditional cisgender, heterosexual, white, middle class, male ideal, uh, they respond to it by overcompensating those traits that they associate with masculinity, such as aggression, a domination, competition. And this is, uh, this is particularly sharp in the prison setting, uh, which is a, an institution where men are put together in close uh, proximity and expected to compete with one another to establish their place in a hierarchy. So how do they do that? They're kind of, they're, they're emasculated by being incarcerated, by not being allowed to provide for their families, by uh, having their pre-prison identities kind of stripped down. 
Uh, so they respond to it by behaving very aggressively, very uh, sort of competitively, and it can be a really tense, scary situation in prisons. Let's pass that around to the group, because I know I know we're all socially distant right now, but we're still experiencing people in the world around us. Um, you know, where are we experiencing those hypermasculine behaviors, those those dominance, aggression, uh, those behaviors? I noticed, Brady, you're wearing your gamer headset. Do you do you game frequently, for example? Like, is that something that you experience um, gaming wise? Uh, yes, actually. Matter of fact, uh, it is. I, I don't get the chance to, to game that often, but when I, when I do, um, I would say that, uh, in terms of, especially with the coronavirus, uh, most men that I am playing, playing video games with, uh, joke about it and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of throw it around as if it's like a joke and it's something not to take seriously and something not to be, uh, afraid of. How about yourself, Ben? Um, so, well, what I thought about when I was thinking about the context of um, domestic violence and uptick in crime, um, the first thing I thought of was that in my experience with toxic masculinity and people I know who are often hyper-masculine, um, it often comes from a place of uh, insecurity. And so I, I feel that when you're alone at your, at your home and you're forced to confront your own kind of um, emotional shortcomings, um, especially when you're in a stressful situation, uh, I could see that um, violence being a reaction to your own internal um, struggles. And uh, I think that's probably contributing to the uptick as well. In addition to um, the reality of the situation for people uh, who are in marginalized communities that might be living in close proximity, not even prisons themselves, but at home, they live with other people, they share a room, whatever, if you, if you never have a moment alone, um, that's going to weigh on you, especially if you're not comfortable um, with your own social abilities. Absolutely. And in adding to that, you know, there's that other side of what happens when we're under stress. Um, there is those addictive behaviors that people have that they seem to go to. Um, and that is, a, is as, the, as the study pointed out, um, could lead people down a downward spiral. Um, and people do need to be aware of, of course, there, there are still, uh, people that people can talk places that people can talk to if they, if they do feel, um, depressed, if they do feel like they're in harm there, there may be some difficulty, but, but a lot of the outlets are still there and hopefully we'll be sharing a few of those on our website as well. Um, if anyone needs to have, uh, need, needs to reach out, um, there are people there that will listen and help. Um, and Sam, I, I know you're all over, uh, Instagram. Uh, and and you see uh, everything basically on the internet. Um, I wish I had the social media footprint that you did. Um, tell me about what you've experienced in terms of of, of negativity um, in and hypermasculine behaviors. Um, there's something that Dr. Uma Umama Heshwar had mentioned in regard to people being stripped of their masculinity in the conventional sense. Mm -hmm. And um, if I can relate it back to the LGBT community and the Black um, community intersectionally. Um, in regard to like mass, incarcer mass incarceration, the black men historically have just have been um, kind of like deviate or separated from that sense of like identity and that sense of um, being like a leader and like a dominant force in their family. Um, and, you know, that kind of like basically trickles down into like the hyper masculation um, or hyper masculinity that basically is embedded into like black culture. And I think um, when it comes to uh, black communities that are, you know, poor and that are in um, destitute areas, like you have like that hood culture that kind of um, perpetuates hypermasculinity because they feel the need to over assert themselves um, coming from an infrastructure in which they were, they had no control of their bodies um, and of like their direction. In regard to the LGBTQ community, I feel as though having suffered years of ostracization and being told that they aren't men enough um, because of their queerness. Um, you often have these characters the in the community that feel the need to um, indulge in like hypersexual activity um, and also look down on other men that don't perpetuate this ideal of a masculine alpha male. Um, so right. there's a lot of like phobia that, um, occurs between our microcosms. 
that that's a great point. You use that that word alpha male, um, and there's so much of of masculine behavior which which kind of promotes that at times. And there's that that cliche almost that expression of of men being a, a lone wolf, you know, just uh, you know being stoic, um, being strong, and handling it themselves. Um, and I want to put this next question over over to Brady here for a moment. You know, what's the problem with men being stoic? What's the problem? With, with men showing emotion and taking it all on themselves? So I think what the problem is, is that being a man and showing emotion, you're seen as weak. You're seen as not being a man. You're seen as uh, feminine, almost almost less than what you are, which is, you know, I'm, I'm a man. And basically it's as, as showing uh, that emotion, uh, that automatically means that I'm, uh, le- uh, lesser than that. And I think where I've had the biggest problem in my life with toxic masculinity would be actually in sports. Um, I have a, a great example of, uh, my, my senior year at uh, boarding school. I was a uh, captain of uh, varsity basketball and, uh, we had a uh, a midseason tournament where we were in the uh, basically the finals to uh, to take home the trophy, and we were playing against a team that previously had kind of kind of dominated us. Kind of you know they beat us beat us by a lot, beat us by like twenty points uh, prior to playing them earlier in the season, and uh, there was a lot of pressure on me um, during that game just because uh, you know I, I was I was team captain I. You know, I averaged the most points, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and during that game, um, going into halftime, uh, we were up. Uh, my team was up by eight points. Uh, I was playing really well. Uh, it was probably probably my best game uh, of the whole entire season. Um, and essentially, the when the third quarter started, uh, about two minutes into the third quarter, I rolled my ankle. Uh, and I, I sprained it pretty bad. Uh, I definitely was was crying. I was crying my eyes out because of how much pain I was in. Uh, my my teammates had to uh, pick me up and carry me off the court. And essentially, when that happened, my uh, coach called a timeout, and he came over to me and basically sat down next to me. And it was kind of the last thing I thought I was going to hear. Uh, was basically him looking at me and saying, you know, uh, Brady, I, this is a huge game. You know, we can, we can win the trophy. You know, I need you to, I need you to man up. I, I need you to man up. And he said that twice, like back to back, like, I need you to man up. Like, I need you to man up. Uh, and I don't think I understood at the time how significant that was. But kind of reflecting on it later on in life, I, uh, I realized what just how toxic that was and how demasculating it was for me. And, you know, the fact that, you know, I, I, I had my coach saying this to me, my teammates were, you know, like, yeah, Brady, like, you got to man up. You got you got to finish this. You got to do it, man. You got to do it. And, you know, I, I, I rolled my ankle like very bad. I could, I could barely stand up. I could barely put any weight on it. Uh, and in that moment, it was kind of like time, like froze. And in my mind, it was like, I felt like I was in the middle of like a, like a stadium. And it was like, there was this bright spotlight on me. And it was like, there was just this Im- immense amount of pressure for me to, to quote unquote man up and you know play through the pain and you know be a man it's not it's not a big deal like you know and you know like stop stop showing weakness and you know sadly i uh you know i i sir came to the pressure and you know which was a big health risk on my part i you know my my the trainer of my team gave me you know a couple of leave they they wrapped up my ankle as best as they could. They they put tape around. Uh, well, they taped up uh, ice around the the bandage around my ankle, 
And I got back out there and, you know, tried to, tried to do what I could, which obviously wasn't much considering I couldn't even change direction anymore, which is a, you know, pretty important thing in, uh, in basketball. And, um, you know, that doing that and succumbing to that pressure, uh, affected me for the next year of my life. I, you know, I got, uh, an MRI of my ankle two days later and I found out that not only did I tear uh, uh, multiple tendons in my ankle, but I also had a hairline fracture in my ankle. So technically, theoretically, my ankle was broken. Um, and it it took about a year to uh, for my ankle to fully heal and uh, come back from that. And you know, still to this day, I deal with uh, you know with physical pain from it. And uh, you know, it's. It's obviously it's my fault, you know. I I, I sort of came to the pressure when I should have rose above the pressure and realized that my safety is more important than my ego and me feeling quote unquote like a man and acting like a man and you know manning up. Um, and that was a uh, that was a pretty significant uh, you know moment for me. And I didn't really put two and two together until uh, a couple years later. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. I mean, you, you bring up that word pressure and I can't imagine having an entire, you know, basketball court and arena, you know, cheering you on to, to go on. Um, and this is sadly some, unfortunately the, the, the unattainable roles that people are expected to be placed in. Um, thank you again, for sharing that um does anyone in the group have any uh response on that yeah yes. ben, go ahead um so through my rugby experience in college um especially as captain uh, i've faced a lot of similar situations to that um but what stood out in kind of uh contrast to brady's story is that the to me it's it's crazy how powerful that dynamic of trying to push through injury can be um, where a lot of times it doesn't even take the coach saying, you know, man up. I have, I've seen kids uh, come off the field very concussed and, um, you know, they're trying to do whatever they can to convince the trainer to let them back on or a slew of injuries. And I uh, always try my best to tell them like to put the whole, what we're doing in perspective, especially at Southern where it's, I mean, we're a decent team, but it's a club sport. So, and I had to like really talk them down off that edge of like going back in the game when they clearly shouldn't. Um, so it doesn't even take a ton of external pressure um, for people to try to push through pain like that a lot of time. Um, and e even I've done it myself um, a couple of times when I, in retrospect, it wasn't worth it at all. Um, but it's this is kind of systemic pressure that, gets drilled into young men's heads that um, <clears throat> if they uh, succumb to weakness or if they succumb to injury, um, especially in a pivotal moment, that um, they're somehow less than and they're not good enough because they're not indestructible, I guess. Um, Absolutely. And it, yeah, so the, the main thing that stuck out to me was that a lot of this is internalized too. It's not just you know a coach telling you it all the time. I want to share some of the um, information that we actually has collected as a class here regarding this. Um, you know, we recently did a, an, an informal survey, uh, the communication capstone course um, about to basically gather opinions that people had on the perception of traits, whether um, emotional traits, whether they're framed as being more masculine or feminine. And sadly, the, the data suggests that uh, traits like emotional sensitivity, crying, those are traditional ma uh, fem feminine traits. And men are expected to be the opposite. They're supposed to, to promote physical strength, dominance, um, as well as anger. Anger is also was reported in our surveys being a more masculine strength. Um, does anyone else have any more further thoughts on on how we're forced into, into these these roles that we have there? in terms of behavior and, and emotion. Sure, I just wanted to quickly add that um, I think a lot of people seem to think that these are traits that, that start during adolescence and thereafter. 
Mm. But sociologists of gender have have started to show how actually not started to they've been for a while just how early um, the, this kind of socialization kicks in. I mean, you're talking preschool and even before then, mm -hmm. uh, where the boys will be boys refrain sets in. And so to speak to what they what the other uh, panelists just mentioned, like this idea that it's it's internalized. Part of the reason it's internalized and it barely even requires any outside pressure by the time somebody reaches high school or thereafter is that they've been, you know, told that since they were two, three years old, that you're a boy, you don't cry, you don't, you know, boys don't do this and boys will be boys. And, and so I think the harm is done so early that undoing it uh, is incredibly difficult because we often get there too late. That's a great point. Brady, yes, you had something you want to say. Also, Sam, I'm sorry. Uh, Brady, go ahead, go first and then Sam. Yeah, so I just think that, uh, you know, we're put, we're put in these boxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, specifically by gender and those boxes say how we are supposed to act and how we're not supposed to act and you know i think i think that has a lot to do with it especially at, at an early at an early age you know I, I i mean as far back as i can remember even from you know friends family uh you know being told you know don't cry you know uh, you know, man up once again. I mean, I've, I've been hearing that my whole entire life, uh, you know, that you need, you need to man up, you need to, uh, you need to act tough, you need to be strong. Um, you know, and I think that these, these kind of these gender boxes that are out there that we're put into, uh, you know, I think it just it kind of takes a toll on society as a whole. Yeah, what do you have to say about that? I mean, how we're placed into a box? Um, in regards to the box, absolutely. Like, um, and then these boxes seem to be infinite. Like, wherever you go and whatever community that you um, enter, like, they're always going to be like even more boxes drawn to like, um, yeah, just box people in even further and like deviate from like the idea of us all just being human beings having human experiences. Yeah. Um, and and I raised my hand earlier because I wanted to address a question. Um, absolutely. Dr. Um, Mama Ashwar. And it was in regard to the construct of like masculinity, masculinity and femininity and whether or not that is made up. Because when I think about it, like, I feel like a society, like we've directed like, oh, because women behave in this way, this is feminine and then men behave in this way, this is masculine. But then like, what about those like in between? And then those like, you know, who just don't necessarily like fit in within the construct, like, is there any other terminology or is there, yeah, is there any other terminology that we can use that basically that um, kind of creates the binary or separate? I don't know. I just, I'm just so, I recently stepped into like this Mommy. inquiry about whether or not masculinity, femininity is actually a real thing. Uh, Dr. Oh, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to make sure you were dead. <laughs> Yeah, I think sociologists have been questioning the binary for decades now. And I think that people, you know, to, uh, at least a, in my corner of the world, really very much see them as social constructs that are what we make them to be. And, and so in my own research, one of the things that I've been trying to draw attention to is, is that masculinity, even in prison, where people think of incarcerated men as these really hyped up, super aggressive, stereotypically violent men, uh, what we're seeing emerge is hybrid masculinity. And, and I really like the idea of hybrid masculinity because the argument is that um, it's kind of like a combination of traditionally masculine, so-called masculine and so-called feminine traits, except they kind of transform one another and create this, this um, alternative way of being a man um, where emotional, you know, to speak to what you said, Jason, it's something like emotional expressiveness among the men I interviewed that was a marker of masculinity for them. And that's the side of masculinity that people aren't seeing so much. And so some of the, the things that we think we know about masculinity, the reason we think that is that we kind of impose on, um, impose on our analyses, impose on our observations, our own biases, right? So we think that incarcerated men are hyper-masculine. And so we didn't stop to wonder, how does emotional expressiveness fit into that, right? And so when you actually start to look at it on the ground, you see that men have really uh, deep, complex emotional identities and that the, this, this binary, this rift between masculinity and femininity 
I mean, it's really nonsensical. It doesn't, mm. it doesn't really map onto any kind of social reality that, that we know of. Mm. Um, it's yeah. more in our minds, right? It's more something that we've created than something that actually exists. That's a great point. And I know we did some further study as a class about um, other things that we thought uh, fit into perceived masculine, feminine uh, ideals. Um, what of those are occupations and roles? In fact, we did a, um, our research recently uh, found that, for example, um, stay-at-home parents, nurses, K-12 teachers, daycare providers, secretaries, and artists, those were traditionally perceived as feminine roles, while doctors, mechanics, scientists, engineers, mathematicians, firefighters, and the list could go on. They're perceived traditionally as masculine roles. And as as we break down, you know, those barriers of of, of gender within those roles, um, we're hit, we're experiencing some conflict there as well. Um, ben, do you do you see any of that? Like, how how does this change of gender really create conflict? Um. So, I have some. I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. It's okay. Um, I think that it's uh, the conflict of it comes for me isn't as much of an external conflict as a lot of people would think. Um, I think eventually it can lead to that um, if individuals aren't um, emotionally equipped to deal with their own internal conflict. Mm -hmm. um, they can that can end up being them creating, you know, violence or whatever other conflict with those around them. Um, but for me, the way toxic masculinity and gender roles fits into that um, is if you say you don't adequately perform in your gender role and then those around you criticize you for it or even I've even people acknowledging that, you you know, um, for me, at least didn't live up to this like masculine ideal at times right. Um, right. can kind of really weigh on your conscience and um, make you question a lot about yourself um hey so i feel that the con the main conflict that first hits you is when say say um around my house for example i'm expected to um i do a lot of like maintenance stuff and like put in light switches and uh mess around with speakers and all, like electronic and hardware and uh like candy man things that my dad taught me because he was a carpenter mm -hmm. um but at, I'm not trained to do any of that. I don't have any real experience working in that field. It's a lot of me just trying to figure it out. Um, and if I if I don't, then I I put all this pressure where I feel like I let my whole house down, and I'm not you know I I, I didn't do this one thing that I should be able to do. Um, and then from there, um, I mean, I typically don't you know I I don't externalize that, but I could see how. Um, different people responding to different stimulus like that. Um, mm -hmm. If you just get in that really negative headspace about yourself, and then if um, you're not used to being self-critical, um, then that can create a really cognitive like dissonance um, from from your own self-image, and that can I could definitely see how that leads to an external conflict where now you're going out looking to make trouble for those around you because you feel as if they've attacked you somehow, when in reality, um, you've just kind of uh, gotten to in your own head about it. Yeah, so that, that presumption that, hey, you're, you, you should be good at, you know, working around the house, you know, you're a guy, those are guys things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, you know, it, you, you might have some insecurities on that or, or the pressure is just too great. I, I completely under, understand that. Uh, Sam, do you have anything you'd like to add on to that? Um, yes. Um, more specifically about the study in regards to like what is deemed masculine and feminine in the workplace, and yeah. whether or not like, because now that I think about like the construct of masculinity and femininity, I think about how like it's those two entities are just a culmination of traits, right? So like when mm -hmm. you completely like remove those titles, you just have a bunch of traits that may or may not fit people. I think people and their personalities are um, also a combination of traits. So like to name this masculine or feminine just doesn't make any sense because it's just like what like in in regards to like the expectation of men 
um, needing to be handy or like do work around the house. Like that's just somebody like, who's just handy, you know, that can be seen. As, <laughs> um, male, male and female. I have a female cousin, like, you know, she, this is actually, this is actually a dynamic that she struggles with in her home, sort of, kind of. Her father is um, my uncle. He's, um, is he a carpenter? He does a lot. He's a jack of all trades, right? And she kind of inherently like picked up that type of like handy type of, I can't even come up with another adjective, but hand, I'm going to use handy. Sorry for being redundant. Um, <laughs> she kind of picked up like that trait, right? So like when it comes to her installing a new living room set or like just doing little things around the house, she does it, but like she wants her man to do that yeah. um, or her husband to do that. And but he's just not a type of person. Um, and not that he's fem, um, feminine or like or whatever. But he just that's just that's, those are things that he doesn't like go towards. Like she kind of had to force that force him to work with her father to install their new floors, right? But these right. aren't things that like naturally that naturally attract him. And I think that that's okay. Like, but mm. and, but that that comes with her being comfortable in her stuff as a woman and wanting to do those things or liking to do those things um, and being okay with her husband not liking to do those things. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it comes just, it just boils down to people just being okay with like accepting people for who they are and not trying to just define everything. Like being that like we are the species who like, who was like the most intellectual on this planet and probably in this universe, maybe I'm lying, but like <laughs> we like to just, find meaning for everything and I think people just need to let things just be but it's hard because we um thrive on the communication we do we love to label those things and, and categorize things um but right. you make a great point you know these things are arbitrary you know these roles mm -hmm. are, are arbitrary but you just made a, a great point how a lot of it is the socialization and how you were raised if you're raised with a house of a handyman and you're a girl you could absolutely be a handyman you know you have some of those skill sets that you were raised with you know um, some of that pre some of that that knowledge that was instilled to you. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Um, I just wanted to add on to that that I think this really speaks to part of um, for this masculinity redefined project. Part of our um, when we laid out our goals and everything was that how this affects everyone. Like how toxic masculinity is a thing that isn't just dangerous for men; it, it affects all of our society. Where now you have you know women who can feel less less of themselves or less of a woman or whatever um because now they're interested in something that's typically masculine mm -hmm. where if you kind of start to deconstruct those roles everyone can feel a little more um comfortable just liking what they like and it doesn't matter whether that's perceived as masculine or feminine it's just what you like and you should be able to feel comfortable liking things Right, which is like such a simple thing to say out loud, but like, this is not the reality for a lot of people. Right, right. Doctor Umama Hishwar, I, I know you 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 mentioned earlier you have you have a couple twins that that'll interrupt your the conversation there. Um, we had a couple of conversations in our class as well about parenting um, children. Now that we're in our social distancing. Uh, is there a, a change in roles there or the roles being reinforced or is is your house non-traditional? What is there a conflict going on? So we were um, I was actually talking to some people on uh, social media about this, about how an equitable gender division of, of household labor requires this like magical combination of being really obsessive and being really lucky. And so for us, we're fortunate. Uh, my husband is also a professor, so we have the same jobs. Um, our schedules are not crammed in the same way. And so it's worked for us. Uh, but I think that's because, you know, we are hyper conscious about it, but also because um, we, we just locked out, right? But, but households across the country, are, and, and, you know, we're already seeing the effect. So I think just in my own world of academia, um, there are journals that are uh, indicating a decline in uh, submissions, in article submissions from women scholars. And everyone is saying, oh, you know, we saw this a mile away, but it's still really upsetting once you see it happen because it's the feminization of, uh, of care, right? So uh, right. when push comes to shove, even so-called progressive, gender progressive couples uh, end up in the, in this very stereotypical division of labor where the, the husband's work the man's work is prioritized over the woman's 
And so if you have children and you're in a heterosexual marriage, statistically speaking, it's the woman's job that's going to take the hit. Um, and it's really, it's unfortunate because this is part of uh, what, we're, what we've noticed in, in the last decade or so is that the so-called revolution, the gender revolution, it's really stalled. It's become a stalled revolution where uh, women have entered the men's world by becoming more engaged in employment and the public sphere, but men have not entered women's world. They are not taking over, um, you know, the cooking and the cleaning and uh, the the changing of diapers. There's and when it happens, you know, everyone really screams from the rooftops about it. But it's not happening enough to change any kind of traditional gender dynamic. And women are being harmed by that, and men are as well because they're they're not getting a, the chance to explore that facet of their identities. Is there a little bit of hope now that both men and women um, are home during our social isolation? I mean, I, I, I don't like to sound pessimistic, but we are seeing it play out the way we would imagine it would play out, uh, um, which is not optimistic. Right. Uh, I think if there were enough push, if there were enough pushback, if, uh, if there were enough awareness about it, I think this would be a right time to kind of implement mm -hmm. that kind of change. Uh, but I think so many people don't even realize they're in that dynamic because so it's so normal. Right. So if you're, I mean, if you're, if you're and are listening to our social media feeds right now, if you're, if you're a dad and you're parenting right now in our social isolation, you're proud of it, you know, definitely, you know, tweet us, share us, you know, let it be known. Cause you know, this is, this is important that, 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 that men are representative as, as parents now more than ever. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question actually about, um, specifically what you were just talking about uh, when you said that um, you're seeing the data showing with women scholars putting forward less um, submissions and everything. Um, is that across the board? I don't know if you have the information on this. Um, like, I, I, do you think that that same thing is happening across the world or is that more um, prominent in cultures like the United States, which is a hyper masculine uh, culture? Um, is it, or are there other places where there's less of a gender divide and you're seeing it's not as stark of a contrast? Yeah, so the data that we're seeing are rapidly emerging, right? Like this is just, and it's very informal right now. It's just mm. the editors of journals who are tweeting about seeing rapid uh, falls in, in submissions from women's mm. scholars. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that it will be worse here in the U.S., uh, partly because it's um, it's a culture that, you know, has not made as much progress on the gender front as some some others, uh, but partly because um, parenting here in, in, in America is really hard. Uh, there's there's not much support for the family here. And so there, there, in, in other cultures, this, this mentality of it takes a village, they really embody that, they really live that. Where the state supports them, there's a lot of familial support, there's a lot of professional support. Um, here, I think what, what COVID-19 has really exposed is just how fragile our, uh, our system is, where it's, it's almost impossible to do what people are asking parents to do right now. Um, you know, if you have a two, a two partner, two working partner household and you have children as well, I mean, you're on call 24 seven, right? If you're, you're engaged in some form of domestic or professional labor from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep and sometimes thereafter as well. Uh, and I think that some support for that, some recognition of that should have come earlier. And, in, and I think in other countries there was, there's just more support for that. There's more awareness of it. And so there's heightened sensitivity to that. Um, where, whereas over here, I think what a lot of people are dealing with is just that we have been called to action on the parenting front, uh, but there hasn't been a, a simultaneous recognition on the work front that this is what parents are, are encountering. And again, women are the ones who bear the brunt of that because women are the ones who bear the brunt of household labor. So sort of to, even though both men and women are experiencing this, um, you know, men's jobs are less touched by it. Uh, than women's and i expect i suspect that more the other more gender progressive cultures aren't seeing quite as radical a shift but the the, the journal data are really preliminary right now right. So we'll have to wait and see yeah i want to i will just jump in quickly to say if anyone listening um wants to ask a question a great place to do it will be on our social media feed um on instagram um it is at 
uh, SESU underscore CMS. Um, if you are on your our Twitter feed, uh, we are at the same, at SESU underscore CMS. Please post a question there. We are going to do a Q&A, so people who have posted Q&As within our Cisco web meeting, we're going to get to that in a moment there, so thank you for posting some questions. Um, but also, I, I wanted to, to change gears on that vein of communication. Um, I wanted to ask Sam this next question as well. So uh, about toxic behaviors and, and, and basically how does it affect the way we talk to each other, the way we communicate? You know, um, you know we have three communication majors here in, in the group here, and we're always talking about how we, how we give and take information. But how do those behaviors change us in the way we communicate? Um, toxic behaviors create walls and like biases and they don't allow people to like see past them um i think when it comes to and when you say communicate i'm going to take that um i'm going to use that broadly and absolutely actually, you can take it any way you want <laughs> last night i was um just tuning into a series of lives with like um people like the queer community um and like we were discussing just a host of um topics and a one of the topics like were just like masculinity, femininity, um, like, you know, dating in the queer community. Um, and I remember asking one of the people that I was watching, I asked him, um, like, you know, masculine or feminine men, like, you know, like, what do you prefer? And he kind of surmised that like, it really doesn't matter. Um, I think he said that like, you know, it's really boils down to just the energy. I think how people present themselves um, whether it's more masculine or something just doesn't necessarily factor in ultimately and i think that that's the thing that's a thought hey! that like blocked a lot of people from finding like just from finding like their one true pairing whether it's maybe because i feel uh, though as though people are so caught up in like this presentation and like what it looks like to the outside world as opposed to just tuning into people internally. I think, so when it comes back to how these toxic behaviors affect us, these toxic behaviors kind of create this utopia that just doesn't exist. Like you, you're like um, romanticizing like this idea of like masculinity or this idea of like how somebody should act and it's just not right. Um, but. No, you made a great point. Like it, the walls that we put up are basically prejudices of how we feel people should act, how they feel, how we feel they should be the dressing, how they feel they, they should look, um, right. how, you know, and, and that, that's a great point. You know, these ultimately these engendered roles that we're placing upon people are, are biases and, and prejudices, you know, that, that we have to acknowledge um, and if we want to overcome them, if we want to change, if we want to learn, if we want to grow, if you're done, um, if you want to experience new things, that's a great right. point. Experience people overall, especially like when it comes to like heterosexuals um, intermingling with like homosexuals and like that old um, idea that like, some heterosexual men did not want to engage with gay men just because they felt as though they had nothing in common. Like that's ridiculous. Um, I've had an experience in which I was like living, I grew up with like my cousin predominantly and her husband um, was like, kind of like not a father figure. He was just a male in the house um, because he's married to my cousin. And I think over time, as I stepped into myself, I think it's, since I was a child, I've always been like more effeminate um, conventionally. And um, as that started to like unravel as I grew up, right? He rejected me um, in very like blatant ways, like nothing like that was verbal, but just like how he acted. And like, you know, when his wife, uh, my cousin would question him about like, you know, why he just was so like, besides himself when it came to just interacting with me and engaging with me it was just that he felt as though i was being pushed on to him um being that i was living with them and also that like there was nothing for us to um there's nothing for us in a there's nothing in common for us to um relate to um and that just j essentially like led to like me like not necessarily like it trickled down to my problems with men in general when it comes to actually knowing how to approach them because growing up i've only had female friends and it wasn't until like mid high school that like I actually had a, a community of um, gay men to relate to um, 
and that was easy because like you know we all weren't interested in each other in that yeah, way no but like when it came to um actually dealing with men that i was interested in like i just didn't know where to start because the foundation mm. wasn't there all the men that i had yeah, with in the past or lack thereof is that when didn't, like, you know help um when it came to socializing and communicating with other men in general Mm. Backwards, anytime the say something, you... Anyone else have anything to add regarding that? I mean, I know myself personally, I think that everyone needs to kind of play um, a social tourist in terms of of people um, experiencing new things. And especially with communication and language, uh, you have to kind of try to learn a different language when talking to people. Um, you have to seek out what is going on in their lives culturally what's going in li in their lives emotionally and and it's kind of like learning a second language it's that you, we use that word communication code switching where you can talk two languages at the same time and switch back and forth to more effectively communicate your point of view and i think there's a lot of it with masculine behaviors you know the sometimes you know if if you, to more effectively you know communicate to someone who traditionally does exhibit more traditional masculine communicative habits that's something you might have to do um versus sometimes where you have to be more you know um emotional you know uh, versus stoic you know so I, I, it's a sad thing that we have to do that but those expected norms make our uh communication you know uh reinforced and the the mo only appropriate thing we can do in my opinion would be to you know be to be a, to prepare yourself you know, do your research you know no try to try anticipate those problems so you don't have those conflicts um that's that's personally my my point of view ben go ahead yeah i'm just kind of going off that i have some uh personal experience like with a scenario like that where um in my own life uh the people i'm friends with and the communities i'm involved with are um pretty aware of toxic masculinity and definitely like proactive in trying to not um exhibit toxic behavior in that way. Um, like, especially like the YDSA at school, that we were very conscious of these social issues and constructs. And that's a big part of what we try to organize um, in fighting. Um, but then at the same time, um, this especially became apparent this last year as I was captain of the rugby team, I had to go into that environment, which is really hard to describe um, just how, how like, masculine and like hyper that uh dynamic can be at times and then it ended up in this situation where i was expected to be you know the 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 man man of the men or whatever and i'm just not really comfortable in embracing that role that much because i honestly think a lot of it's bullshit and um i just don't support a lot of those behaviors as, as me and i don't feel comfortable doing them and so it created a situation where I wasn't able to be an effective leader um, because I, it's not that I couldn't do those things, but I don't agree with them. Right. So while I do agree with you that it is important to know how to communicate with different people, I think it, it, again, it's also very important to constantly be, you know, really thinking about what you're doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because there definitely are behaviors that, you don't want to indulge in when trying to cross bridges. Does that make sense? You have a great point. You have to be considerate. You really have to think before you speak. You know, if something you say uh, can hurt someone, you know, then then just don't say it. You know, uh, you, it's okay to be silent. Um, that that's a great point. Um, I like to move on to just if you want to take a couple of questions right now. We did have a couple here within our WebEx session. Yeah, um, no one's really said anything in the social media feeds, but if you if you still want to go ahead and send any type of messages onto our posts in our social media feeds. Um, or uh, but the couple of questions we had here, I see Martin uh, posted here that uh, he says with regards to our conversation about being handy in a handy household. You in and you don't really. Half, he says. He says when you are raised in a handy household, but you don't really have that feel for it, you may be seen as less than. You know, so that that contributes to that pressure um, that people could experience. Yeah, I can absolutely understand that, Martin. Um, you know, being in an environment where where you have that pressure and you feel less than. Um, we have a question here um, from Kay, uh, Kay Michelle, who's one of our podcast uh, hosts previously. 
Uh, she says she wants to know actually from the group, how would you say music plays a role in toxic masculinity? Uh, we talked about this a little bit in 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 Sammy J's podcast um, about about the music that he's experienced and and the toxic tones to it. Um, what what would the uh, we want to start off with Sam a little bit? You want to start there? Um, yeah, uh, we have a lot of music and a lot of genres that have historically contributed to hypermasculine and um, misogynistic like ideas. Like and I, this conversation didn't necessarily go there, but um, a lot of the times when we're discussing like masculinity, uh, we when people kind of reject um, that certain things are feminine. I feel as though that's kind of like them deeming femininity as being lower than. However, now that I've had this conversation with you guys and just over the couple of um, days that just have passed, I've kind of like gone in a direction where I am deviating away from just the ideal of masculinity and femininity existing as a thing. However, when it comes back to just because we are people communicating things and labeling everything. Um, yeah, like music can help or not help. I don't know, right. like we know hip hop and like, you know, where that traditionally comes from. But all of these issues are just so layered and multifaceted. So right. I, I can't dwindle down to give you something specific because my mind is everywhere, but somebody else can jump in. That's okay. Oh. Culture is, is, is complex, I think. Uh, yes. Music is complex. There's so many different styles of music, so many genres of music, and it makes you feel so many different things. I mean, you, one song can make you feel one way and one song can make you feel another way. Um, you know, atmosphere is, is also important. So you're listening to, at a party or at a club is different than when you're listening in a car. Um, but the question is, is how does that music reinforce, in my opinion, those, those behaviors that are toxic? How does it reinforce those problems um we really have to think about what we're listening to. although the hook is nice the message might not be the best for us um uh as as a society uh, ben you had something you wanted to add to that yeah so music and a lot of art in general to me um i i view it i think a little bit differently where um i don't see so much that music and art are necessarily the things propagating this although i'm sure there are some people who do create things with that goal in that case i would say it's probably not art as much as propaganda but um Thank you. when it comes to representation of toxic masculinity in a lot of these art forms i think that in my perception of it at least it's more of a reflection of society than um, necessarily the driver of those behaviors um if that makes sense and i i it's it's really complicated because it's something i struggle with a lot where like you'll be really into an artist or whatever and this happens all the time and then it comes out that they did something terrible mm. and it's kind of having to and then like you look at their lyrics more deeply and like wow they were talking about doing this terrible thing and i thought it was just them being expressive but they really did this terrible thing um and then you kind of have to confront that so it is really difficult to parse through mm -hmm. but i um i view music particularly as more of a culture's uh expression of itself than necessarily the thing that's creating that culture if that makes mm -hmm. sense that's a good point um yeah, we create the music not the music creates the culture um going back to Going back to Brady's story, I have a question, another question from John Zappi, one, one of our other hosts from our previous podcast. He asked, um, how can we make coaches or athletes more aware of the toxic language that is coming out of their house, of their mouths? Like, th how do we change those behaviors? Um, actually, I'm going to tie this. I'm going to I'm going to actually uh, place this to everyone here. because the second question that I have here was from Jacob, um, which is which is very similar. It's like, how do we go about confronting toxic masculinity in our social conversations? Um, Jacob, our other host from a previous podcast. But, so that, that begs the question, like, how do we fight these behaviors? How do we change? How do we learn? Um, and, and, and how do we change the way we communicate? Um, let's start, I'd like to start off with Sam, if we could, on that one. Um, I think it just starts with calling it out. Like, people, mm -hmm. 
in our social dynamics, like with our friends, with our family members, like we just like to be um, non-confrontational and just like yeah, this is my not have to make everything conflict. But mm-hmm. honestly, um, it's gonna have to be. You're gonna have to get uncomfortable before you get to a place where everybody's comfortable. At the end of the day, like you're gonna have to suffer or sacrifice it, it, your part, um, like a peace of just momentarily to address um, these things this, and then you know we can all come I feel like first off she and I can be friends I feel like we fit and feel comfortable dealing with each other at the end she's like, I'm so sorry, I think it just starts with the kids. actually confronting it and not like letting it okay. pass by he said don't worry I have absolutely Ben I see you're nodding your head very much <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I, I've too. recently kind of stepped as I've been been more um I've been doing some like self-education on a lot of this stuff and um with the rugby team again i've there's been situations where um in the past they've said things that i've personally disagreed with but i was like it, it's like that classic lion right like everyone's entitled their opinion it's what but mm-hmm. then you kind of get to the point or i have where you have to acknowledge that certain opinions are harmful and you should not give them equal footing compared to other like like if you're if you're putting forth a misogynist opinion, I'm not going to respect that. You know what I mean? Um, and it is, it, it takes, I, it makes me very uncomfortable whenever I have to confront something like that. I have a lot of social anxiety. So um, it really like weighs heavily on me. But once you have it, you know, set in your mind that like, these are the things I stand for and it doesn't matter who it is saying something against this, you if you stay true to that, um, it can help. But yeah, it is really the basic of like, the basic principle of staying true to the values that you espouse. Um, and then calling that out and saying, hey, that's not right. And making people think about what they're saying. And it, it's unfortunate because sometimes people will build a resentment for you because of it, because they're like, oh, I have to watch how I talk around them. But for me, I don't, it doesn't bother me that much because at the end of the day, I made you change your thinking. That's what I wanted to do. Whether you resent me for it or not is your issue. Right. Brady, do you have something else you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, kind of to go off what uh, what Sam and Ben just kind of said, it, it, it starts with, no, with no, having the conversation. Today. Right. You know, I, I think um, as, you know, as athletes, as an athlete, you know, uh, we don't feel comfortable uh, kind of what kind of what Sam said um, in terms of you know talking about it because it makes us uncomfortable but the only way to break down that barrier is by having that conversation and making it uncomfortable because once you do that you're able to kind of then get to a place where everyone can kind of be on the same page and agree you know about it and how it should be talked about and kind of the just the way that it, it should work, you know, as right. opposed to, to just these, you know, these, you know, like just kind of, once again, to come back to it, just these gender boxes being, being put on you and being forced upon you, um, you know, just, just based off your, your gender. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a, it's a lot of, uh, finding that neutral ground. That's a great point that, that everyone's put out there. Um, we just want to very quick both veer off track for a second, and I want to give uh, uh, Dr. Umama Heshwar the the final upper the final say in, in how we should probably combat this. But we had one quick question from our Twitter feed um, that someone wanted to know. Uh, this is from Claire on our Twitter feed. Um, was there ever a moment um, where people in the group second guessed something they did or liked because it was seen as more masculine? It was not masculine or feminine? um was there was there ever something specific do you want to take that i will okay go ahead oh sorry i i think brady's hand was up as well so i'll let him talk Uh, thank you sorry uh no just all i all i was gonna say is that um i uh i have growing up uh through middle school and high school i uh i would babysit a lot um and you know i babysit for family friends for for cousins you know uh things like that and i know that i used to kind of get teased about it by my specifically by my male friends um because of the fact that 
I was, you know, like being, I guess, quote unquote, uh, a, a caretaker, which kind of goes back to, you know, the fact that we put these labels on, on job fields and, and jobs and, you know, gender biases about specific jobs and, you know, like, oh, if, if you know, you can't be a girl and be a mechanic or you can't be a guy and, you know, work at a daycare, be a daycare provider, like, um, you know, which, which showed in our research that that is what, what people think, uh, at least based off the data. And, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, it shouldn't be true. It shouldn't be true. I, I, I hope it's not true. Uh, but I definitely, uh, you know, got teased for that, uh, in middle school and high school, um, you know, because of the fact that, you know, on the weekends, instead of, uh, you know, not every weekend, but some weekends, instead of, you know, going out with, you know, my, my buddies and, you know, playing, you know, tackle football in the backyard or, you know, playing manhunt or, you know, you know, whatever, whatever it was, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was taking care of, uh, you know, of people's, uh, people's kids. Absolutely. Dr. Mamaheshwar, did you want to add to that question? Yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to add, I mean, from, from a personal standpoint, growing up with an older brother, I think many people, many girls will go through the tomboy phase. Uh, it was prolonged for me, but I also wanted to point out that it, it's not symmetrical. A girl growing up who wants to behave more like a boy, who's got, we have the tom, tomboy label. Right. There's yeah. a growing acceptability of that. Like there's the it's fine if you're if your little girl wants to play soccer and is, you know, kind of into roughhousing, you know, you you're almost like proud of it now. Right. You're like, oh, I've got like the badass princess trope. Right. Um, she, she's she's really feminine, but also really badass. Um, there is not that same kind of acceptance of boys who want to engage in stereotypically feminine behaviors. There just isn't. Uh, so I wanted to kind of call attention to that, that there's there's it's fine for girls to be tomboys, but the moment boys try to, to embrace feminine traits, they get, they just get skewered with all of these derogatory labels. Um, and I think that points to how restrictive our definition of masculinity is that femininity is, is not as fragile, right? You can be a girl and be so many different ways and people are okay with it. Uh, but if you're a boy, you have to be this very specific way or else you're not good enough. Sam, I know we talked specifically about this in your podcast and you had your hand raised right there. Uh, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, um, just bringing back to my upbringing, I've always um, liked traditionally like feminine things. Um, and I've had to deal with like my fair share of family members telling me that, oh, like, you know, boys aren't supposed to do this, that, and the third. But it never like skewed even it never skewed me away like sometimes it might have to like, do it in secrecy but like at the end of the day um this is just like who i was truly and even um now like as an adult or young adult i should say um i've stepped more into the realm of like being gender clear like with my um gender expression right and the kind of like disarray that like my mom has had to kind of deal with or um i've had to deal with is definitely telling of the rigidity when it comes to the complex of a male and how mm -hmm. even women can um perpetuate like these toxic um toxic masculine ideals and have like you know just when i think of like the times that i've put on something that's feminine whether it may be a dress a blouse a skirt whatever the kind of shift in um the reaction that i get is like a shift in like humanity in a sense in regard to like what am i looking at like you're not even like you anymore but like at the end of the day it's just a piece of clothing and who i am and my ideals and what i think like i'm still the same kid that, that i'm that not talking so yesterday. if you need something like, let me know me putting on a skirt and a pee putting on pants does not change that you know what i mean so I think it just comes down to people um, needing to let people be people um, and define themselves and stop contributing to these abusive institutions that don't inherently help anybody, whether you are masculine, feminine, um, black, brown, you know, marginalized, whatever the case may be. Like, it, 
all of these like expectations and these constructs come from one main thing, right? And I think that comes from like the supremacy of um, the institution that America has established. And once you perpetuate one thing, it perpetuates another, and then it just builds. And and it, um, altogether, it surmises in you jailing yourself in a system that was never made to liberate you. And I, oh, wow. I just want to I just want to add to to Ben to Brady to Dr. Umama Hishwar to say it, thank you so much for for expressing yourselves um and sharing and and pushing and fighting back um i i think that's definitely something that that as, as we've expressed and learned through this conversation is important um and the more communication that we do the more we talk about it uh the the how i feel is be the best way uh, that we can we can combat this i want to give the last word to dr Umami Hishwar. how how do you feel what, what would you say is the best way that we can combat this yeah, I think we we have to start with recognizing again, um, everyone here spoke about how speaking out is important, calling it out is important. But I also want to draw attention to the fact that who who gets to do the calling out, right? Um, women aren't as uncomfortable as men calling out those kinds of behaviors. So if you're in a mixed gender group and somebody says something really misogynistic, you might have a few of the girls in that group say, that's not cool, don't talk like that, right? right. The reason it's, it's so it's not social like generalized social anxiety or generalized um, discomfort with confrontation. It's specifically men who are uncomfortable challenging other men in many instances. It's that you don't want to be that dude who stands up against another dude and says, that's not cool. Right. Because, again, somebody someone wrote an entire book on this, how like gender is accountability, like you're being held accountable by those norms. Right. And the moment you try and push back, you get stigmatized. So it's not even like, okay, that might be kind of awkward. It's that you're afraid that the next time somebody wants to go out to get a beer, you're not going to be invited because you're that yeah. guy. All right. So, so who, I, I think when we say it needs to be called out, it does, but I think it needs to be called out by the people who are in a position to change it. And in many instances that those people, women can shout from the rooftops. Um, and we've been shouting from the rooftop. Uh, but it's not done a whole lot, right? What we need are the people who kind of embody that that uh, valorized ideal masculinity, right? We need the white, cisgender, young, middle class to affluent men uh, to be the ones to stand up and say that's that's not that's not okay. And also to recognize that the reason that they're uncomfortable doing that is is that they they worry about how they're going to be perceived by fellow men, not so much by women, right? Not so much by non-binary individuals. They're worried about how they're going to be perceived uh, by men just like that. Uh, so I think that kind of heightened awareness and and self critique is really important if we're to change this. I like the way forward. she talks about things. I agree. And let's hope that we have many people listening right now that that message uh, resonates with and can pass that on to people that they meet. Um, and again, so this concludes then our live video podcast of Masculinity Redefined, A Lone Wolf. Um, I'd like to thank our guest speakers, um, Dr. Umama Heshwar, Brady Agovino, Ben Kroll, Sammy J. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank all of our followers on the internet um, who I hope are social distancing and staying safe. Um, and trying to alleviate the stress during these difficult times. Um, I've been your host, Jason Karubia, and I please encourage everyone to continue the discussion um, with people that you meet. Also visit our website, www.masculinityredefined.info. Uh, follow our social media accounts on Instagram and Twitter. Again, that's at SESU underscore CMS. We do have a TikTok uh, account as well. Um, that's at masculinity redefined and defined is D E F I N D. Um, please follow those social media accounts, continue that conversation with us. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you again, everyone, uh, and be well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jason.